Welcome all of you that are joining us online. We wish you could be here, but uh, with these times, we know you can't. But you're glad, we're glad you're here. We do want to tell you one thing real quick, and the fact that we've been having internet problems. And uh, just to let you know, we did record our uh, rehearsal just to make sure. So if it goes down, we'll have somebody else post uh, our rehearsal to make sure that it gets through there. But uh, we are live, and we're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us online for the first time, let us know. We'd love to welcome you. And so just put new in the comment section. And as Amber was telling you before the service, that all of our pastors, all of our staff is online. They'd love to talk with you if you have any prayer needs or just uh, want to talk to somebody about something. But we just want you to take this next time that we have during this service and just remember the fact that God loved you so much he sent his son to die on the cross for you. And on this Good Friday service, we celebrate what Christ did for us on the cross. So let's continue to worship. There's nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. There's nothing stronger. Good Friday is a, a powerful reminder for all of us that truly the cross does have the final word. You've heard me say throughout this time what we've been um, quarantined at home and unable to meet. You've heard me say many times that Jesus offers the solution before the problem ever presents itself. It never was that more true than at the cross. When you read Revelation 13 and verse 8, the Bible says this. Listen to the significance of these words. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Think about that. Long before God ever stepped from nowhere to stand on nothing and speak everything into existence, he already had this thing of our salvation completely worked out. Jesus went to the cross not as a victim. He went to the cross as uh, planned in the council halls of eternity. It was sovereignly decided before he ever created anything that he would be the solution 
to the problem of sin. And certainly when sin entered the picture, so many other things happened as a result. Such an incredible domino effect. You have sorrow as a result of sin. You have suffering as a result of sin. So when we think about the cross, we think about the solution to the problems that plague mankind. And truly Jesus coming and his going to the cross provided that solution. I think about the cross and I think about what he said from the cross. How powerful were his words. When you hear the, the last words of a dying person, they carry a, a, a certain amount of weight. And the power of his words are so incredible and so weighty for you and I on this Good Friday. As we think about the first thing he said, you remember? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I mean, you would have thought that that would be the last thing coming from his mouth. But instead, it's the first thing that he said was this idea of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. And then you had those two thieves, right, on either side. One of them was ridiculing him, mocking him. Hey, if you're the son of God, save us and yourself. And the other one said, don't you realize who this is? And then he humbly said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus looked at that thief and said, today you will be with me in paradise. So here you have this amazing love of Jesus Christ uh, demonstrated from the cross. He looks down and sees his mother there and he sees his best friend, John. And he says, John, take care of my mom. I'm not gonna be here on this earth to do that anymore, so I want you to take care of her. So he had his family in mind. He had his friends in mind. You see this amazing, awesome love of God. And then it isn't long until you read where uh, at noonday, the, the, the clouds became, became dark and the clouds rolled in and it was like midnight. And the Bible says from the cross, you hear Jesus now say, not my father, but my God, my God, he said, why have you forsaken me? And you have to understand what happened in that moment when the skies grew dark. It was in that moment, Jesus had so completely became sin. The Bible said, he who knew no sin, he who did no sin became sin for us. All of the sins of the world, all of the sins past, present, and future were rolled upon Jesus on the cross in that moment. And he had so completely become sin that a holy and righteous God could no longer look upon his son and he had to turn his back on his son on the cross. So Jesus cries out as he became sin and he took my sin and he took your sin in that moment on the cross. My God, why have you forsaken me? That was the very moment that Jesus wished that you know, would not ever happen. Remember in the garden when he prayed and the Bible says his sweat fell as great drops of blood? And it was in the garden when he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Now understand, he was not saying, Lord, if there's another way that I can get out of going to the cross, that's what I want to do. No, he was dreading this very moment. He was dreading the moment when his father would have to turn his back on him, when God would forsake God because of sin. So Jesus cries out there on the cross, why have you forsaken me? And then a little later on that cross, you hear him cry out, I thirst, which is a reminder to us all that he was human. He was the God man, just as much man as though he were never God, but just as much God as though he were never man. So he cries out there from the cross and he says, I thirst. And then finally, you see Jesus getting to this point where he says, Father, into your hands, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Remember, he now calls him Father. He's moved past that point where the sins have been atoned for. He says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. And yet he becomes sin for us and he moves past the point and now he's simply crying out to God and he's saying, into your hands, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And then he said this, and this is gonna be the focus for my time with you just for a few moments tonight. He said, it is finished. It is finished. The Aramaic is telelestai, telelestai, it is finished. Now, what he didn't say is, I am finished. Now, we wouldn't have been surprised to hear a dying man say his last words, I am finished, but that's not what he said. He said, it is finished, meaning that there were certain things that Jesus completed that he finished while he was on the cross. And on this Good Friday and on this worship service, I wanna talk about the things that he finished while he hung on that old rugged cross. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old where the dearest embeds for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll change. 
So Jesus cries out from the cross, it is finished, it is finished. So what was finished at the cross? What did, he, what did he mean by what he said? Well, here's one of the things that I know that he meant by what he said was this, the sacrifice that was needed to satisfy the justice of God on sin is finished. The sacrifice is finished. When you go all the way back into the Old Testament, even from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, uh, offered sacrifices. Once sin entered the picture, God had made it plain that it would only be through the sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. The best of the flocks and herds had to be given each year. And in offering that sacrifice, in essence, God would make atonement for their sin and their sins would be rolled forward till the next time of sacrifice. And so it was their feeling of guilt and their need for connection with their creator that caused them to offer these sacrifices. And man, when you leave uh, Adam and Eve and you just trail throughout all the Old Testament through the tabernacle and through the temple, you'll find this process of offering a sacrifice, doing it the way God said to do it, bring the very best because it's going to represent the Messiah who will come one day. So it had to be a, a, a lamb without blemish or spot it had to be the best that you have, and you brought that sacrifice, and when you presented it, the priest would lay his hands on that sacrifice. It would be symbolic of the fact that your sins were being placed on that animal, and then the blood of the animal would be shed on that altar, representing again the cross of Jesus where he would bear our sin and pay a blood sacrifice. He would pay with his life for our sins to satisfy the justice of a holy God on sin. So think about it. Throughout the entire Old Testament economy, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of sacrifices are being made, and each sacrifice is appeasing and rolling forward those sins for just one more year until that has to happen again, until one day John's baptizing on the banks of the Jordan, and he looks up and sees Jesus, and listen how he announced him. He says, behold, the Lamb of God, that's a sacrifice, the Lamb, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. When you read the book of Hebrews, one of the things that the writer of Hebrews makes plain is because of the cross and because of what Jesus finished on the cross. Listen, there's no more need for sacrifices. All of those sacrifices were satisfied in the sacrifice that would end all sacrifices. And that's when Jesus Christ shed his life blood on the cross. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission. 
So on this Good Friday, as we think about what ended when Jesus said, it is finished, we think about the sacrificial system that ended, and we think about the blood that Jesus shed for the remission of our sins. What a powerful thought. So there at the cross, our Lord says, it is finished. And as I said a moment ago, it was indicating that the sacrificial system was now complete. He was the sacrifice that ended all sacrifices. But think second with, secondly with me tonight, it also indicated that separation was finished. The separation between man and God finished at the cross. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, it's sin that separates us from God. You go back to where the train jumped the track in the garden with Adam and Eve, and one of the first things they did after they had sinned is they hid from God. The Bible records how that God would go and he would walk with them in the cool uh, of the day, and they would fellowship and commune with each other. So when the Lord shows up in the garden, Adam and Eve are nowhere to be found. And God calls out, Adam, 
where are you? Now understand, God was not asking the question for his information. He's sovereign. He knew where Adam was. He was asking for Adam's information. He wanted Adam to realize where he was. He wanted Adam to know that he went from fellowshipping with God to hiding from God simply because of sin that was in his life. Sin is always separated. It separated Adam and Eve from God. It created not only this separation from God, but enormous guilt. That was why they hid. There was this feeling of, of guilt that flooded their mind and soul. And not only that, you have this condemnation that was come into their life. And as a result, it was passed on as judgment upon all mankind because of their sin, this idea of condemnation. And you and I, as sons and daughters of Adam, we understand that we're born in the world with a, a sin nature. David said, in sin, my mother conceived me. Uh, Proverbs says it's as easy for us to sin as it is from the sparks of a fire to fly upward. We can sin effortlessly because of our old nature. So we're born separate from God. It was why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night in John 3. Nicodemus knew there was a distance between he and God. He felt the guilt and the condemnation and the separation. And he asked Jesus, what can a man do to be right with God? And Jesus just looked at him and said, Nicodemus, you just need to be born again. And Nicodemus didn't understand the terminology. He said, how could that happen? How can a, a man that's grown be born? Can he go the second time to his mother and be born? And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. I'm not talking about a physical birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. And Jesus talked to Nicodemus about that idea that we have to be born again. And once you come into that relationship with Jesus Christ and you receive him and you accept his sacrifice, his payment for your sin, and you receive him as your Lord and Savior, what you find is that that, that separation from God ends. Listen to the writing in Romans chapter 8 where Paul says in verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful thought? The fact that once I receive Christ and I accept his forgiveness of my sin there on that cross, I'm no longer condemned. He doesn't see me as being condemned. He sees me as being forgiven. And you read a little farther in Romans 8. And he said, who will lay anything to the charge of my elect? Meaning there's no one that can accuse you of anything that God has not already forgiven you of. What does that say to me? No guilt. <laughs> no guilt. Man, once God has forgiven you, forgive yourself. His forgiveness takes care of the sins of your past. It takes care of the sins of the present. It takes care of the sins of the future. Listen, there's nothing you could do to make God love you more. And listen, there's nothing you could do to make him love you less. His love for you is complete. So there's no condemnation, Paul said in Romans 8. Uh, there's no more guilt. And then he concludes it at, toward the end of Romans 8. And he said, who shall separate us from the love of God? that is in Christ Jesus. And he lists a whole litany of things there that one might think could separate us. And Paul said, none of these things can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Friend, when you receive him as your savior, you're no longer separate. I've shared this with you before, that beautiful reality in Hebrews where he said, I never leave you, Hebrews 13, five, I never forsake you. He won't remove his presence from you no matter what you do or how far you go. He still loves you. That's why we have everything to celebrate and everything to rejoice in because of the price that he paid for us there on the cross. Truly, Jesus paid it all. He made it possible for us to no longer be separated from him. Thank God for the cross. Child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. been talking about what our Lord finished while he was on the cross. I said all of the Old uh, Testament sacrifices were now finished. I said the separation that happened as a result of sin is finished. But I want to close with this and we'll receive communion by also saying that salvation, the work of salvation that God was doing is now, now finished. The work is complete. So many other religions have a works component that are necessary for a person to be saved. They'll tell you you have to do this or or stop doing this. And they lead you to believe that, you know, that salvation is a, you know, a behavior modification. That you change the way you're living and change the things you're doing so that God will love you. And they have it just the back, just backwards. It's just the opposite way is true. God doesn't love us because he loves us in spite of. In fact, when you read Romans 5, 8, he said, get this, in that while we were yet in our sins, Christ loved us. In fact, throughout all the Old Testament and over into the New Testament, people were saved by faith, looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. In fact, when you read Romans chapter 4, when Paul was writing about Abraham and it said, what is it that Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, what did Abraham, what did he discover? And then Paul answers and says this, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Listen, all those Old Testament saints that were in that sacrificial system were saved by faith, looking forward to the day the Messiah would come. The one would come to end the sacrifices. The one that would come to end the separation. The one that would come to secure their salvation. They died in faith believing one day Jesus would come. All of those Old Test- New Testament saints, even up into our day, we don't look forward to that day. We know it happened. Instead, you and I look back at that day believing that one day Jesus did come. That's why the cross is a centerpiece of all human history. You look forward to the cross in the Old Testament, New Testament into our day, you look back at the cross. But the most significant event that ever happened in the human experience was the fact that God sent forth his son, sinless son, to bear our sin on the cross, became sin for us, 
to satisfy the justice of God on sin, that sin that had separated us from God, that sin that had condemned us in the eyes of God, that sin that had produced so much negativity and guilt, Jesus, through his sacrifice, uh, ended that. It ended there. And salvation through Jesus Christ was complete. That's why the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is that decision to choose Jesus. The most significant thing, Jesus said in John 14, 6, look, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It's not by your righteousness, not by your religion, it's not by your rituals, it is by your faith and in, in relationship in Jesus Christ alone. Let me ask you on this Good Friday, have you ever humbled your heart? Have you ever swallowed your pride? Have you ever invited Jesus into your life? What an amazing night this would be. And how many people who are watching would celebrate along with all of us with you if you made that decision tonight? So I'm gonna ask you to do something right where you are. I'm gonna ask you just to bow your head, humble your heart. Pray this simple prayer with me. Pray this prayer and say, Lord Jesus, I believe one day you went to that cross and died for my sin. And with all that is within me and with all that I know about me, I trust all that I know about you. Come into my life, forgive my sin, be a reality in me. I'm tired of doing this on my own. I'm tired of living with so much anxiety. And tonight, Father, I surrender that, I give that to you, and I trust you with all that I am. And I ask this in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to know about it, rejoice with you in that. Now we're going to do something we've invited you to do there at home, and that's to share this moment of communion with us. You remember in the upper room when Jesus sat with his apostles just hours before the cross, he talked to them about the significance of the bread and the drink. He took the bread and he reminded them that this bread represents his body that will be broken on the cross, his body that will be offered on that cross for our sin. The Bible said he didn't have sin, but he would become sin for us. And he became all that we are so that you and I might become all that he is. And that night and that time of intimacy and that time of worship and that time of connection and love Jesus had with his disciples, he took the bread. The Bible said he blessed the bread. He gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he had a drink. And the drink, he said, represents my blood that will be shed on the cross. He reminded them of the Old Testament passage that says, the shedding of the blood is the ultimate sacrifice. Greater love has no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus would pay the ultimate price with his blood. He said, this blood represents my covenant with you. So he gave it and he blessed it and he said to them, drink all of it. Then the Bible said they sang. It doesn't record what they sang. We have no idea. But Jesus led the song. Not only did he lead the song, he selected the song. I thought about this last week, how in Zephaniah chapter three, the Bible talks about a time in heaven that I'm looking forward to. And he said there'll be a time in heaven when can you imagine all the throngs innumerable around the throne of God, worshiping him and praising him and all of a sudden, the Bible says he'll rise from his throne and call all of heaven to silence. And it says, Jesus will sing over us. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? All of a sudden, Jesus is going to sing a solo. He has written a song. And in that song, he's going to speak and talk about how much he loves us, how that his love took him to a cross, how his love enabled him to fulfill God's plan for our salvation. And what an amazing, incredible time that's going to be so jesus in that upper room led them in a song and i want you to continue to worship with us in this song
you've done for me thank everybody for tuning in and watching us online and we hope you've shared this with somebody and if you did make a decision if you did pray with bill tonight we want to know about that put something in the comment we've got pastors online they'd love to pray with you they'd love to talk with you about what the next steps are and if you have any other prayer needs make sure that you let somebody know because uh, we want to be there for you before we go, I just want to remind you that tomorrow, starting at 10 a.m., our, our kids are going to have an incredible Easter jam. Make sure you tune in and watch that online. We've got an incredible uh, children's ministry, and they put this whole program together, not just for your kids, but for the whole family. So make sure as a family you sit down and watch this online and, uh, and be a part of that. We also want to thank all of the, the volunteers that are going to make our food pantry go tomorrow. They've done such an amazing thing that through this time that we've been quarantined, we've actually seen that our help of people have gone up. We've gone from, from about 350 to now over 400 families that we're taking care of through, the, through uh, our food pantry. And it's all because of you. It's all because of your faithful giving and, and because of the fact that you know that ministry happens because of what you are doing. So we, we thank you for doing that and we've made giving online easy here. So uh, we'd love to have you uh, continue to partner with us through this time. And also we want to remind everybody to be back tomorrow night. We have a service at five o'clock and we've got two on Easter Sunday morning at 9, 30 and 11. It's gonna be completely different. And uh, we can be different because we've got such an incredible, incredible team that puts this all together. They can kind of adapt. And we also got an incredible tech team that is making this all happen. And uh, we thank you for that. We're glad you're here. Make sure you join us in tomorrow and Sunday. But we just want to continue worshiping as we sing about our Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb. night and we'll see you tomorrow.